Well, good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. May I ask everyone present to turn any electrical devices to silent so it does not interfere with the business of the meeting. Um, we have uh, visiting today Rhoda Grant, MSP. Welcome to you, um, to committee this morning. Now, if I can turn to uh, <coughs> housekeeping matters. Um, first of all, item one on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Is the committee agreed? Yes. Thank you. And I'll also indicate uh, at this point that um, I may have to go to another committee very briefly during the course of the meeting, in which case the deputy convener, John Mason, will then um, take the chair. Um, so, if I might uh, start also by explaining what we have today as a, a round table, which is meant to be um, a format where people can come into the discussion on points that uh, they have something uh, to say on. And uh, in the interest of hearing as much from our guests today, I would ask members to keep their questions fairly brief. Now, if anyone does want to come in, if they could simply indicate by raising their hand so that I can bring them in. No need to press any buttons. The sound desk will switch the mics on and off. So if you simply indicate you want to come in, if I bring you in, uh, then the sound desk will simply uh, operate your microphone. And um, also, we're looking, as you'll know, at uh, issues that have arisen regarding BIFAB. So the, the sort of... Um, in the interest of uh, everyone knowing the, uh, where we're going, as it were, uh, we intend to start by looking at uh, BIFAB, um, available opportunities surrounding that, then look more generally at the Scottish supply chain, um, consider issues on the relating to the contract for difference and the Murray East wind farm, and then finally uh, look at future opportunities and consider uh, issues that arise uh, more generally there. So if I might um, start, first of all, by um, asking each of our guests just to introduce themselves and say very briefly uh, who they are, what organization they're from. Um, I've already mentioned uh, Rhoda Grant, uh, MSP, who's here. And perhaps we could start with uh, our guest, Peter Welsh. Uh, and then come round the table, each uh, of our uh, guests introducing themselves in that way. So we'll start with Peter Welsh. As you said, Peter Welsh, GMB Scotland, Campaigns and Communications Department. Andy Whiteman. I'm oh, sorry, are you wanting members to introduce well, themselves? Members could introduce themselves as well, very briefly. Andy Morgan. Whiteman, MSP for Lothian. Uh, Nick Sharp, Director of Communications at Scottish Renewables. Jackie Bailey, MSP for Dumbarton. Audrey McKeever, Director of Energy and Low Carbon for Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Jamie Hugger Johnston, Highlands and Islands MSP. Um, Pat Rafferty, Scottish Secretary of Unite. Colin Beatty, MSP for Midlothian North and Musselburgh. Uh, Dean Lockhart, MSP for Mid Scotland and Fife. Andy McDonald, I'm the Interim Director of Energy and Low Carbon at Scottish Enterprise. Gordon McDonald, MSP for Edinburgh Pentlands. Angela Constance, MSP for Ammon Valley. Bill Alkington, I'm Chairman and Founder of the Jave Driver Group of Companies, which uh, owns uh, now. Uh, by that. Sean Power, I'm the Vice President of uh, DF Burns. Uh, DF Burns is a JV driver company uh, on the east coast of Canada that uh, BIFAB reports into. Uh, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Andrew Jameson, the Chief Executive of, of the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Our prime remit is to drive innovation into the offshore renewables sector. Um, thank you. And I'm Gordon Lindhurst, MSP for Lothian Region and Convener of the Committee. Um, so if I might uh, start with a couple of questions uh, about uh, BIFAB, um, and perhaps Bill Elkington or Sean Parr may be able to answer some of these in the first instance. Um, first of all, how many people are currently employed in the BIFAB Europe? How many people work there? In the Fife region, we still have only a minimal workforce of about 30 people uh, working for us right now, and that's mostly management people, I think with a couple of union people. We've been doing a lot of training and, and preparation work with, with that part of the workforce. However, up in our niche, I'm happy to say that there are about, I think today, 85 people working. Uh, so we're, we're able to get that plant uh, working again, but um, still working real hard on the Fife region. You say 85, are these all permanent staff or some agency workers? 
uh, I, I, I had to take some advice on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they're all permanent staff. Yes. Yes, they are. And do you know how many were employed there at its peak? The maximum I think we've ever had at our niche before JV Driver owned it, it was about 150 people. And do you see you getting back up to those numbers? <coughs> that again? is certainly the intention. Our intention in, in our niche, and as well as for BIFAB in particular, is to, um, is to hopefully take advantage of some of the renewable projects, the offshore wind projects, in order to, um, in order to stabilize the company and then, then diversify so that we get in back into offshore oil and gas decommissioning and so on, so that the, there's a stable workforce in Arnish uh, and not one that sees the peaks and valleys. And I think uh, uh, in 2017, the company was possibly looking at going into administration, is that right? Yep. And um, why was that if you are looking at things longer term? Bill um, The uh, 2017, uh, we were looking at the company to acquire it uh, prior to it uh, having the difficulties. And what occurred in uh, 2017 was really a perfect storm. Uh, the Beatrice contract had a significant amount of change, um, up to 25% increase in weight on those jackets. And unfortunately, John Robertson, who was the president at the time, um, he also passed away. And that created that perfect storm. In our due diligence on the company, uh, the, uh, uh, we determined that it was going to run out of funds um, and inform uh, Scottish Enterprise and, and the Scottish government. Um, and they were not going to be able to complete that contract. Um, that indeed did happen. Uh, they did not, I mean, they were not able to settle their change at that time. And when John passed uh, uh, with, um, with the, uh, most of the negotiating um, res uh, uh, capability and relationships uh, for uh, BIFAB, um, that put them in a very poor position. Um, they did uh, eventually, and, and we helped them after we took over, um, resolve uh, the issues with uh, on the Beatrice project, but not at the uh, value that should have been unlocked, unfortunately. Um, running out of the cash uh, in 17, put them in a, in a very, very poor position. And what has been done to ensure the future of the company, to secure it, to ensure that um, things like this don't um, cause this sort of situation to arise again? So a number of issues uh, that we, we uh, determined um, in BIFAB. Um, first and foremost, uh, project controls. Uh, we've we've uh, instituted um, a training program with the staff um, to improve project controls more in line with the way <coughs> JV Driver does things. Um, also, from a safety perspective, we've uh, instituted training, and up in Arnish, uh, it's being uh, uh, our safety program is uh, being uh, implemented very successfully, and and so uh, see a lot of improvements there. Um, so the the key aspect of project controls, how to run the costing side of the project and know exactly where you are, especially amongst change, is, is, a, is a key change. BIFAB, if I may just add to that, BIFAB had 25, previous to us owning BIFAB, they had 25 years of success. Uh, they, had a, they had a bad project with a tough client, and that happens in this business. Um, but we understand what happened there. We're able, we're able to help support them and fix it. And um, so we're, we're, we're changing what went wrong, but, but it's still a solid company. And, and has that also looked to securing future work <coughs> for the company, future uh, orders? We, we've been flat out since we, since we purchased BIFAB in trying to secure more work for the two yards in Fife and, of course, Arnish, and with some success in Arnish. Um, we have, um, I, I pretty much live here in, in Scotland these days, and, and all of our resources from Eastern Canada are focused here in Scotland now because we want to ensure that, that we bring more work to the yards. <clears throat> Those negotiations um, have been much longer than thought and less fruitful 
than thought than than we thought. However, that being said, there were still others on the horizon. But um, yeah, so we've been working really, really hard to to um, to work on to get some contracts. And have you been successful? Uh, not at this time. So uh, I'll just give you a little bit of the the lay of the land uh, on the East Murray project. Um, the the awards went to uh, Lamprell, uh, the previous project Lamprell had done. It was 225 million U.S. dollars. They lost 80 million dollars, U.S. dollars. Um, the uh, result of that was a, a lawsuit as well. Um, that was settled, and they received 45 jackets uh, from GOC in a non-bid basis. The next uh, chunk of work we bid, and we were the low bidder, um, and we uh, then went into a recycle mode with the um, with the uh, EPC, and they asked that uh, the um, bidders create a joint venture, which is very strange when you're in the middle and you've already been uh, bid the work. That joint venture um, had attached to it risks that were just not um, sustainable from a commercial standpoint, and we, we indicated we were not able to join in, in a joint venture taking on those risks. Um, Smolders, who they've done a lot of work with the parent company, did accept those risks, or uh, they negotiated over six months. We don't know in the end what they accepted, but um, that was uh, uh, a very different um, procurement cycle than we've ever seen before, where you bid the work, um, you're the low bidder, you don't get awarded the work, um, the information gets shared amongst the bidders, and you're asked to create a joint venture at that time. Um, that uh, work went to a, a company that uh, um, the EPC works with um, significantly in Europe, and unfortunately, we did not win that work. On Kincardin, we uh, lost the work to uh, a company called Navantia. Navantia loses 35% on every, uh, every amount of revenue it does. It's a state-owned company in Spain. Um, they carried out the, um, the work that they carry out. For every 100 pounds of work, they lose 35 pounds. That's not a commercially viable um, operation. And, you know, we've, since we've uh, come to uh, Scotland, we've learned a lot about state aid rules. And we're not quite sure how that fits in state aid when um, it can't, uh, there's so many things that we've talked to the, the uh, Scottish Enterprise and Scottish Government about that we would not be able to do um, and, and be uh, compliant with state aid. So um, right now, we're quite concerned about, uh, uh, you know, competing against businesses that lose money. If we're 10% different than uh, 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 Navantia, we were 10% above them, that means our cost structure is still 25% below them if they were not losing 35% on every contract. Um, I want to just bring Peter Welsh in at this point and then Andy Whiteman. Um, Thanks, Jim. Um, I think for context, it's important to look at BIFAB um, prior to the problems that it that found itself in November 2017. Um, on the contract for the Beatrice project, they're manufacturing 20, 26 jackets, turbine jackets, and that was supporting um, an estimated 1,400 jobs across the three yards. The core workforce and agency workforce, um, majority be an agency, but that's a level of employment um, that was supported by that contract at that particular time. And it gives you a glimpse of the, the potential and the levels that certainly these trade unions are looking to get back to in that regard, um, and you know, that's dependent upon success of future contracts. Um, but I think it's important that, um, that we qualify that so that we can see where we were and where we are just now, and the challenges um, and learnings that we need to take um, from the, the recent bids to get us back to that situation, if possible. Thank you. Andy Whiteman. Yes, I'm interested just in following up with Unite and um, GMB on the commitments that you believe were made in relationship to offshore fabrication work, uh, particularly in the Concarden project, uh, uh, in relation to BIFAB's role. Um, what, what commitments do you understand were made and uh, who, who made those commitments? You, 
could have let that appear. Sure. Um, yeah. If I may. Um, and uh, bear with me, I'll just refer to it. Um, what we're looking at in the first instance, um, and I don't know uh, of uh, any commercial uh, understandings that there may have been um, between the employer um, and, uh, and the Scottish Government, um, based on the investment that the Scottish Government has in the yards. So, but we can refer to um, is the uh, consent letter, the Section 36 consent letter um, for the planning process and environmental process to do with um, the Kincardine project or coal, um, as it was known. And within that, um, on page 43 um, of the consent letter, um, the Marine Scotland consent letter, um, it touches on the economic benefits um, of the project and what that refers to in there. Um, I can read that to you um, if, if you grant me the time to do that, just to tell you what it says. Uh, so page 43, um, the statement says the economic benefits and uh, material issues which must be taken into account as part of the determination process. On page 44, it goes on to further say that the environmental statement makes a commitment to the construction of the substructures, which is expected to be undertaken um, within uh, a Scottish port facility, and that this is likely to include a significant level of support at regional UK-wide level. Um, the question that we have in there is then, why has that not come to pass um, if we're operating on that understanding um, within the letter of consent? So that this, this, these were comments made in a consent letter, um, which has got nothing to do with the commercial implementation of a project. It's got to do with the consent for the development itself. Sure. Yes. Well, I'm not privy to the commercial uh, uh, sure. details, which I'm sure you'll understand. Yep. However, if there is within uh, Marine Scotland um, an understanding um, that there would be worker value from the project, and that work and value hasn't emerged from the project, then it stands to reason that it's a reasonable question to ask why then that has not emerged. And why then do we have these commitments within um, within the consent process uh, if they can't be if they can't be if they can't be delivered? Okay, well we can follow that up sure. with me in Scotland. Mm -hmm. Does anyone Thank else wish to make a comment on that? Respond to that? Um, Pat Rafferty. Yeah. I think it would be reasonable of the, the Scottish people to, to understand why you would have such a consent letter in there, um, given that the, um, you know, the consumers in Scotland do pay a levy um, in terms of their bills and electricity bills for, for renewables to be put in Scottish waters. And so it's understandable that you would have that type of um, documentation there that if, you're, if the people are paying for this, that you would expect some manufacturing of that to be based in Scotland. So I can understand why it would be there. Whether it's legally enforceable or not is another question. Um, but I can see the principles of why it would be there. I think Gordon MacDonald wanted to come in at this point. I was just looking for a, a point of clarification more than anything else. I was trying to um, read through the papers that we had been given to understand the relationship between different organisations and companies about how these um, contracts were awarded. And... Um, came across a company called Cobra Wind International. How do they fit in and how contracts are awarded relating to the Kincardine project? It's maybe one that um, Sean might be better placed to, to answer than, than myself, but they'll be the CFDs really that gets awarded this and then tier ones and tier twos would, would emerge from them. Cobra was a tier one contractor on Kincardine and they would have been our client had we been successful. The, the, uh, the way the, the wind industry uh, is working here is you have the developer and then you have a tier one contractor and then subcontractors or tier two contractors. Um, in, in Cobra uh, uh, won the, the Kincardine work um, and they're actually owned by the developer. Um, the, so then they tendered out the work. Um, Navantia, uh, won the award by 10% uh, uh, lower than us. What's bothersome there f for me is um, Scottish taxpayer and ratepayer subsidizes the CFDs, and yet, um, and they make a commitment of 60% 60, 60 work or a certain amount of work to be done in Scotland, uh, and then the, there's nothing to hold them to that. Um, in Newfoundland, where DF Barnes works, 
uh, we have these local benefits agreements. And so when someone's going to develop an <coughs> offshore resource, uh, they make commitments to um, the government of Newfoundland that they will do a certain amount of work in Newfoundland. If that doesn't occur and they break those commitments, that company is then fined a value. And we had one developer that decided not to do some work there and it cost that developer $150 million. And when we see commitments from developers uh, in most jurisdictions, um, they either live to those commitments or if they don't, um, there is some form of penalty to pay because it's the, you know, the, the, the Scotland is doing a fantastic job in the UK governments of bringing in um, wind development and actually lowering the cost of, of wind over time with the eight megawatts that's in, uh, gigawatts that has been installed. And yet um, on some of these projects, they're getting no direct benefit on the infrastructure. And that really is a travesty um, that, that, that needs to be addressed uh, through either regulation or, or government intervention of some sort. Just uh, to be clear, are you, are you saying that this Cobra Wind International is owned by the developer? And is there therefore a lack of transparency? Because looking at Companies House, this company was only set up a number of months before the contract was awarded with a share capital of £100. And it just seems a bit surprising. I mean, is there enough due diligence taking place in companies that are bidding for contracts? Are, are you, do you want to respond to that, Bill Elkington? Or? Uh, are you meaning d enough due diligence being done by those giving the consent? Yeah, yes. Um, I, I think someone from the Scottish government should yeah, answer that. It would be hard for us to tell. Well, that, was, that would have been done before we were on, on the picture, in the picture. Right. Um, Peter Walsh. I think, again, Chair, it's important to put into context of what this looks like. Um, Cobra Wind International, um, being either part of or closely aligned to the ACS group in Spain. Um, and Navantia, obviously the state ship builder, which is 100% owned by the Spanish state, um, is currently sitting on £390 million pounds worth of debt. Um, the five foundations for the Kincardine project that Navantia will, will manufacture now, that's 1.25 million man hours uh, of work, 15,000 tonnes of steel. That's the extent of the work that we're we're trying to compete for that we aren't getting for the Scottish uh, project, which is uh, Kincardine's more important in terms of its symbol, not necessarily its size in comparison with other projects. Say, for example, Moray East, it's for floating offshore wind, um, which potentially we're looking at as a next generation technology within the industry. I understand. Um, I've seen the Crown Estate reports that say that floating offshore wind um, is forecast to support. 33.6 uh, billion a GVA supporting 17,000 jobs by the middle of the century. It was an opportunity for Scotland to get to the forefront of an emerging industry. Now that work will be done in Spain. Um, and coming back to um, the Marine Scotland consent letter there, so the questions I think that need to be asked then is what were the expectations of ministers in terms of employment? Um, why did the commitments in the consent notice not come to pass? And what do we need to learn and do to ensure that it isn't repeated in future? And Pat Raffer, do you want to come in? I think probably from, from where we're sitting, um, it doesn't look like due diligence has, has been taking place in terms of the working of contracts. Um, as Peter is saying, but for the Maury East, you see Demi, um, then Smolders, um, Kincardin with Cobra, and then Navantia. And you have to question about European legislations and you know how strictly we seem to be abiding by them, but it seems to be getting ignored by um, the Spanish and, and elsewhere, um, which is really quite concerning for us. So, I mean, we were told, you know, we've heard, you've probably heard it many times about Scotland being the, the new Saudi Arabia for renewables. I think if we continue in, in the way that we are, in terms of how these contracts are getting awarded, then we're certainly not going to be the Saudi Arabia re renewables. They'll be getting built in Saudi Arabia and shipped across here. And that's something that we need to try and make sure does not harm. And Andrew Jameson wanted to come in. I just wanted to echo some of the points that, or the earlier points that Peter made 
Um, Kincardine is, relatively speaking, a small project, but an important project nonetheless, because it is pioneering uh, floating wind technology. We all want to see skills transfers from the oil and gas sector that Scotland has long enjoyed the benefits of uh, transfer more and more into our future prospects for, for offshore wind. And floating wind is, is the answer in a more medium to longer term route because it's more expensive to do currently than the cheapest, best option. So I think credit needs to be given to the people doing the Kincardine project for showing the market the way forwards. There are questions to be asked about where the orders went. I'm not taking that away from anybody in here. But it does raise the, the point that there are different technology types out there that all need to be looked at. So are we looking at monopile for, uh, construction? Are we looking at jacket foundations? Are we looking at uh, um, uh, float and sink concrete-based foundations? Or are we looking at floating wind foundations? There are lots of different options to be considered in the marketplace in the future. And what we lack is a big strategic overview about where is the market truly headed. And so that for the for the manufacturers, what should they be investing in for the medium to longer term future? So as they get it right, we don't end up going around in circles and doing it twice. Other countries have already made those decisions, which is why they've got scale that uh, is tending to outpace anything that has happened in the UK. I won't just say Scotland, but in the UK. Um, and they may well come unstuck because you might find that the technology choice in the future moves to something else. Um, but it is showing, I think, the ultimate thing for me is to truly examine how do uh, our esteemed colleagues to, to, to the right of me here at, at BIFAB and others improve their level of confidence in what it is they need to invest in in their yards to get the scale to compete with what is naturally happening overseas? Right. Um, just bring Bill Elkington in and then John Mason. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with floating wind being uh, um, a, a game changer for the future. Um, but the difference between the technologies it doesn't really matter for us doing the fabrication if we're competing against um, companies that are allowed to lose 35% of their revenue. Um, we're not going to be, be able to commercially compete with that if uh, the, the uh, work continues going offshore. And it's, if you look at their tax rate, they're making um, thousands and thousands of jobs in Spain and basically um, cutting it off at what it would cost them from a tax perspective, uh, the income tax that they get from the workers. And, and none of that is happening in Scotland. And so um, as time goes on, this, the, the Scottish industrial complex will be hollowed out and it will mean that work keeps having to go offshore. And so uh, you know, we would recommend that something gets looked at for um, uh, uh, the bidders on these projects, if they have state aid, um, if they uh, uh, should be pre-qualified and reviewed by um, a, a regulator of some form to see if they abide by state aid rules, um, because that that is the only thing that will change the outcome of, of these offshore companies that are supported by their governments um, to this extent. Uh, we'll never be able to compete with them on any of the technologies if that is allowed to continue. John Mason. Thanks. So, I mean, that was exactly what I was going to ask. Whose job is it then, if there is the allegation of state aid and unfair subsidies in other countries, whose job is it to challenge that and raise that? I mean, I know that's happened here, that uh, Glasgow City Council and others have been challenged about state aid. Uh, does Scottish Enterprise have a role in this? Should they be raising it with the European Commission? Uh, Pat Rafferty. It's a good question. <laughs> so um, we would, you know, try and say that yeah, the Scottish government should have a role in that and Scottish Enterprise, but it could be challenged by the companies the likes of BIFA, but even for that matter, from a trade union <coughs> perspective, could be challenged. And Peter Welsh. The short answer is all of us. Um, Bill Alkington. The uh, in other jurisdictions, what? we've seen happen when this type of uh, competition is in the mix is that the, the, the regulatory uh, regime sets up either a bid depository or a, 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 a qualification um, process so that uh, all, all uh, bidders are on an even playing field. And we have no problem uh, 
With the facilities here in Scotland, what we have in Fife and Arnish, we can compete with anybody in the world if people aren't uh, on a planned basis losing 35% of their revenue or more. Um, Andy McDonald. Sorry, I was just going to make a comment that I, you know, I think, as, as Peter said, if there is evidence of state aid uh, breach, then it's collectively for us to challenge it. I think the challenge is finding evidence of it. There is no question that, as, as Bill said, that we've advised the company here heavily and, and quite, quite openly on how to, to stay within state aid rules, given the work that we've been doing with the company here. The, you know, the bids that they make are state aid compliant, but in terms of international competition, it's the company could challenge if they wished, and, and others could challenge if they wished, if there is evidence of a breach of state aid. I'm not in a position to say that there is, and we're not the regulatory body that puts these contracts in place. Jackie, Jackie Bailey. Forgive me for just cutting to the chase, but the dogs in the street know that there's state aid breaches in Spain, and you can point to companies in Spain being given an advantage that companies here don't get. Now, I understand it's everybody's responsibility to go challenge these things, but I'm quite a simple person, and I can't help but wonder why aren't we doing the same as happens in Spain, to create that level playing field. And I wonder whether Scottish Enterprise specifically and Highlands and Islands Enterprise have considered this. In the context of are we in a position to it, it, somehow subsidise that or, or it, to challenge It is clear that other governments are subsidising, okay? So whilst it may be productive to go away and challenge that, surely the quicker route in is to do what other countries do, which clearly must be in keeping with state aid because nobody has yet challenged them. So my apologies, but that's not... To my mind, our position for Scottish Enterprise, we would have to be guided by the government, of which we are the Economic Development Agency. You provide them with advice too, don't you? We do. What would your advice to them be on this issue? If there is a way of doing this, we're, we're not in a position to, to change state aid rules or to breach state aid rules. We've explored how we can support the company within the state aid rules, and we've, the support that we've provided thus far has been within that and to allow them to stay within that so they're not challenged. <coughs> I think, I think the question is, if other countries are doing things a certain way and they are within the state aid rules because they're not allowed to go out with them either and they seem to be succeeding, um, why are we not? And is that not being looked at to say, in fact, we can do this too? If it's within state aid rules, then we will certainly look at how it could be done. But if, well, are you but doing Well, the that? issue is we've looked at how to help the company get its costs to a point where they can be competitive. And as, as Bill and Sean have said, without the Spanish company's ability to change how it, you know, to, to, to basically operate at a loss, the company here is competitive. Um, Andy and then Jamie Halker johnson Andy Whiteman. Um, we don't know if these state aid rules, rules are being followed or not, is the clear answer. That's my um, point. I'm the afraid. prima facie case is that they are not being followed, they're being breached. Um, it's everyone's responsibility, but ultimately, the people that have the resources to be able to take a case to the Court of Justice on state aid uh, is the government, um, either the Scottish government or probably the UK government. Um, has Scottish Enterprise or Highlands and Enterprise provided any advice to ministers on the, liable, on the likelihood of success of any challenge that they may bring? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm afraid I can ask. And check. What is your view as to whether state aid rules have been breached or not? I haven't seen evidence of state aid rules being breached. Nobody has provided me personally with evidence of that, and I can't comment on. So, what is, others is the me. news that the um, Avantia bid was making a loss of 35%? Is that news to you today, or did you know that before? I didn't know that personally before. I can't speak for my colleagues in the team that I've worked with, with BIFAB, but I didn't personally know that, no. So, that's news to you today? It is news to me personally, as I say. I don't know what uh, okay. my colleagues who work directly with the company. I haven't been involved in working directly on the company sure. stuff. Um, that's not, that hasn't been my role to date within yep. this. I was asked to come because of the, the broader issues. Sure, no, I understand that, yeah. yeah. But I can, I can ask if the information was known. The other point on that, however, would be knowing whether that is as a result of a breach of state aid rules, which is part, part of the question, or whether uh, it's because of the structure of the company. I understand that BIFAB is a account-managed company. Yes. So it seems reasonable, given that we're providing some state support yes, to a private company, um, 
that if that company is being disadvantaged by breach of state aid rules, that a view is taken by the government agency who are supporting that company and that appropriate advice is given to ministers in Scotland and the UK as to whether they believe a state aid rule breach has taken place. I'd be very interested in due course um, if Scottish Enterprise could <coughs> correspond with the committee or on its views on that matter. Yes, I can, can I add if, if you could as well after the session write in if there are further uh, points that you would uh, like to make to the committee um, if it's not possible to respond in the, in the time limits we have here. Um, I, I'm just wondering before we move on to other committee members' questions, um, Audrey McKeever, is there a comment on this from the point of view of your position for Highlands and Islands Enterprise? I'd just would like to add that I think that from a state aid perspective, um, clearly any support that, that's been provided to the company or to any company that we engage with, um, we absolutely make sure that we do that within the confines of state aid. Um, and because what we do understand, if there was any um, challenge against that, the risk is not to Highlands Islands Enterprise, the risk is to the company, and we would never want to put the company in, in that position. And I think in terms of the, the evidence gathering um, around the, the intelligence that we're getting now around the contracts that are being awarded, it's not new to me today, um, but it is relatively new to us in terms of the, the learning that we're getting through the, the more recent contracts. So um, we are very much working with government, with Scottish Enterprise, to really understand the nature of this and how, how do we respond collectively to support the company and support the broader um, supply chain and offshore wind. Um, I just want to bring in, uh, first of all, Jamie Halker johnston and then um, Rhoda Grant. Thank you very much, Kavina. Just, just on this point, uh, is there not a risk that if, uh, if as has been suggested, um, we, we simply ignore um, state aid rules, that that will just lead to further undercutting of the price, uh, prices going forward? Uh, and secondly, I mean, if, there, if, as is suggested, people, you know, there's a feeling that these state aid rules have been uh, have been breached. What legal advice has been sought, either by by FAD, the unions, or um, either of the enterprise bodies? on this that may give a clearer indication or at least some kind of legal legal ground. Sean Power. Thanks. <clears throat> First of all, um, I don't want to leave the impression here, we wouldn't want to leave the impression here that BIFEB has been out there by itself with any, any kind of government support or advice here over the last number of months. The government has been, and, Scott, and Scottish Enterprise has been, has been completely 100% supportive of us, and we've had long discussions, long meetings about the challenges. And at where they can, Scottish Enterprise have, have been helping. It, our ask of them, or of government, has never been to match the subsidy that Spain are giving. I, don't, I, I think that, is, that would probably be a mistake. Um, our ask is that we have some way of ensuring that when a developer makes commitments, that he's regulated to stick to those commitments. Yes, they're, they're regulated to stick to those commitments, but also that in terms of state aid, um, that companies that are uh, not necessarily living up to state aid rules be excluded from the bidding process. So all of you can look up Navantia's financials. You can see year after year they lose 35% on their revenue. And would that qualify um, if, if we were losing 35% of our revenue and Scotland, the government of Scotland or the uh, government of the UK were subsidizing us at 35%, it would be pretty clear from the advice we've gotten from Scottish Enterprise and others that we would be in contravention to state aid rules. So um, w when, when the uh, developers are selecting tier one and tier two contractors, those contractors should have to show that they are abiding by all state aid rules. And if there's some form of regulatory bid depository, the, the government would be able to actually see it. Going down the rabbit hole of trying to match subsidies, I, I wouldn't recommend. I'd recommend on the flip side, controlling who's bidding, and if they're not living up to the requirements of state aid, they should be excluded from it. And then I think we would have a bunch of people back to work. Jim. Um, Rodeo. 
Grant. Yes, just on that. I mean, can we turn it slightly on its head? And, and given that many of those contracts need some kind of government a consent or planning permission or the like, um, and some of them are actually let by government, surely in part of that we can we could make part of those regulations, and indeed if it was a government contract, stipulate that it had to be shown that they were adhering to state aid rules, that there was no dubiety whatsoever. Could we use the powers we have rather than maybe, and, I, and I'm not saying we shouldn't go um, to court to make sure that they do abide by state aid rules, but is there things that we could put in place very quickly um, to say that companies not abiding or being seen to abide by state aid rules should not be let contracts? Sean Power. No, that's, we would agree with that. I'm just, I think the question was, is there anything that could be done relatively quickly to um, seek to bring about that result? Well, commitments from the developers to live up to the consent letters would be one. Um, th really, that's a local benefits type agreement. Uh, and, and two, um, as you, in May 9, 2019, there's going to be other um, uh, contracts for difference let, and in those consents, um, you, I, I could see no reason why you could not um, just enforce the fact that anybody bidding on the projects uh, should meet all state aid rules. But there would have to be follow-up and follow-through yes. to check that that was actually <coughs> carried out and yes. then enforcement through the courts if I need am. be. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um. Yes, Dean Lockhart. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just on the question of uh, financial support and government support, what, what financial support has the Scottish Government uh, and the enterprise agencies given by FAB over the past uh, two years, and what conditions uh, were attached to that financial assistance? Um, there's a mat as a matter of public record, prior to us acquiring by FAB, there was... Um, there was uh, uh, support provided to the company um, in 17 and uh, in April of 18 in the tune of a, a, approximately 25 million pounds. And w was that in the form of a loan or equity linked uh, <coughs> assistance? Uh, well, what shareholding does the Scottish Government have? The um, shareholding for the Scottish Government is a is, is a uh, commercial arrangement. Um, I don't think I'm the right person to answer that. Um, we have confidentiality and we have a competitive position um, to maintain. The, um, the uh, funding was provided to BIFAB prior to our acquisition and we uh, bought um, the majority of the company as a going concern. Uh, are you able to tell us uh, some of the conditions or the main conditions attached to the financial support provided by the Scottish Government? Uh, in, in what respect? Uh, it, the terms of repayment, uh, does the Scottish Government get a seat on the board and does the Scottish Government get input into the strategic planning of the company? The, <clears throat> the Scottish Government, uh, first of all, the, the conditions, and we won't get into the details of the, of, of the conditions or the details of our financials at this point in time, but the conditions that the money was provided on were market conditions as advised by third-party accounting firms, um, and the repayments will be based on market conditions, so and, they're, and they're treated as debt at this point in time. So uh, other than that, we won't get into anything else on the, on the financials because there is a competitive disadvantage to displaying that to all of our competitors. Um, and I, I, so I might think that answers your question. Is there something else? I guess the question of shareholding, uh, does the Scottish Government have uh, a shareholding in the company? Yes. And can you tell us what that shareholding is? It's, it's, it's not actually determined depending on the drawdown of any money, and so that will be obviously a minority share, but it's not actually determined. Right. And in terms of the influence the, the Scottish Government has on the management of the company or a seat on the boards, uh, what uh, influence or role does the Scottish Government have in terms of the uh, plans for the company going forward? The Scottish Government sits, um, doesn't necessarily sit on an official position on the board, but attends our board meetings. Okay, thank you. 
Right, I'll come back to Andy Whiteman before we move on to another area with questions from Colin Beattie. Andy Whiteman. The record I understand that Parliament was told last year that the Scottish Government has a 28% shareholding based on its existing loan could, facility. And, and, and that, could, yeah, that, could that could rise oh, to 38%. Yes, that's right. Potentially. Just for yeah. the record. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, Colin Beattie. We've heard a fair bit about uh, the uh, issue about state aid and so on. I'd like to have just a wee, uh, wee look at competitiveness and so on outside that. We've received evidence that uh, the Scottish share of the offshore and wind fabrication markets only about 10%, and that the North Sea oil and gas fabrication market is somewhat the same level. And the share of the North Sea decommissioning market is about 15%. Now, these, to me, seem pretty pathetic figures, given uh, the opportunities that we've been told exist in this market. We've heard about state aid and the impact of, of uh, state aid in other countries and how this might impact on the, on the competitive advantage or disadvantage. Outside of that, is state aid the only thing that's impacting on Scottish competitiveness, or are there other factors that need to be taken into account? Is there, is there something out there outside of that? You know, the yards that Bifab has have, um, well, two of them specifically have the bones of being world-class facilities. Uh, there is some investment that is required, especially in methyl. Uh, to make it world class. And we've talked with Scottish Enterprise. I've toured um, uh, yards around the world. Uh, I've done a lot of work, had a joint venture in Korea. Um, we've uh, worked with the Chinese yards. We've uh, worked in the US yards and in uh, um, Canadian yards. And the, the bones of a world class facility uh, are there in. <coughs> in methyl and the Arnish facility. Um, Bifab, is a, uh, uh, the Burnt Island facility, is not quite as up to uh, par as, uh, as, as methyl. But um, methyl needs some uh, infrastructure spend over time to allow it to be uh, 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 easier access from a logistics perspective so it can be the the uh, loading and offloading point for all uh, offshore wind. It's so close to the fields, it's, it's a very logical perspective. Um, there's other things like right now it, it can get very, very muddy. Occasionally it rains and it, it needs concreting uh, in the yard and cranage. Uh, but what we've offered is to do a tour with Scottish Enterprise and, and others to show them some of the yards, these other yards we've worked in around the world, and how we can get to an actual world-class facility there, and that is, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that attracted us to Bifab is, it's very close to having world-class facilities, but it needs a little work and a little help. Now you're talking about getting a Scottish Enterprise involved. Does that mean you're hoping for? further funding from the Scottish Government in order to achieve that? Well, the, the, the methyl yard is owned by, um, is not owned by us. We're leasing it from Scottish Enterprise. And so we're, we're the uh, uh, tenant. And so we need to work with our landlord, so to speak, on what type of improvements we can do. No, I'll take that as a yes. Um, <laughs> but that, that's by far. But what about uh, other yards? What about other facilities in Scotland? What about the competitiveness there? And again, I'm trying to park the question of state aid aside because that's a particular issue which hopefully eventually we can get our hands around. But what else impacts on, on competitiveness and the future prospects? And maybe this is something that Scottish Enterprise or HIE might like to also comment on because they're very much part and parcel of this. Um, Nick Sharp, Peter Welsh and then Audrey McKeever wanted to come in, so perhaps in that order. Thank you. Um, as you know, Scottish Renewables represents 260 member companies uh, working in all parts of the renewable energy industry, offshore wind, uh, just being one of them. Um, we've held extensive conversations with those members ahead of today's committee, um, as we do as we do constantly, and, and we've seen a lot of consistent <coughs> messages come through from our members, um, some of them supply chain members, some of them developer members. Um, there are a number of known issues, I think, which address uh, the question beyond state aid. Um, but as far as we're concerned, those issues are fixable. And, and it is possible for Scottish and, and indeed UK yards to be competitive in offshore wind. But um, 
I just talk briefly to those, um, and then perhaps if we want to go into a bit more detail later on, we can. Um, I think the first one is a historic lack of investment, and, and um, Bill Elkington pulled that out there uh, quite clearly, that um, money has not been invested in the facilities, the BIFAB facilities, and, and it's left BIFAB at a competitive disadvantage to yards which have moved ahead, and those yards primarily are in Europe, and that is a lot to do with the way that offshore wind contracts are tendered. Um, the tier one uh, structure, the EPC structure, which Bill spoke about, um, I could go into a bit more detail if necessary. Um, but really yards in other countries have invested when we haven't invested and have moved ahead. Um, and the fundamental difference is that those yards are now capable of doing process manufacturing of large pieces of fabricated steel 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, to a quality and at a cost that, at the moment, with the lack of investment that we've seen um, in, in UK yards in general, really, at the moment, we're, we're just not capable of, by and large. Um, you did ask about better examples in Scotland and, and, and the UK more widely. Th those examples do exist, and in our membership alone, uh, CS Wind in Campbelltown is held up as a really good example of a company who's taken outside investment at a similar level to the Scottish Government's investment in BIFAB and really turned around the way they produce very large, uh, they, they, they make turbine towers, so very large pieces of steel. Um, they, they sought to improve their process to the extent that they doubled productivity in a year between 2017 and 2018, which is, um, which is really impressed industry. And I think I, I've heard that from the conversations I've had over the last couple of weeks that, that that's really impressed industry. So we can talk more about those things, but there are certainly things that, that can be done here and the issues are fixable. And Peter Welsh. Um, I think there's no doubt that we need investment. Um, the question is, where will it come from and how much? Um, and the weather people that would probably be the best place to answer that uh, and what's feasible. But what I would say is that more than that, we need an industrial strategy. Um, and hitherto, there hasn't been one. And uh, we need this for offshore wind and probably more broadly for the renewable sector. The reason being is that there are projects still coming down the line. Um, I've seen media reports that have suggested that you know, we're coming to the party late in the day. That much is true, but the industry has not passed far from it. And we're told continuously that these are the jobs of the future. So if Scotland is going to compete for its share for the jobs of the future, then we need the right investment conditions, but we also need the right strategy as well. And I think that's again, is incumbent upon all of us to do that. Um, but that's the challenge, I think, that we need to set out from today and take forward into the summit that's coming next month um, with Scottish ministers, the UK government, the industry and the unions. Um, but, yeah, an industrial strategy is needed to see what the future looks like and what, what can be achieved, and to this point, it's lacking. Um, Audrey McKeever and Andy MacDonald. Thank you. Um, in terms of the infrastructure investment, if I be a bit parochial in terms of Highlands and Islands, um, over the last decade, we've witnessed over 170 million total investment into key ports, harbours and infrastructure sites, and that's been a mixture of public and private. Um, just want to highlight, for example, Nug Energy Park and in the 56 million investment there, um, led by the Global Energy Group, and including just over 5 million from Highlands and Islands Enterprise. I think um, if you were to uh, visit that site today, you would not fail to be impressed by um, the scale of activity happening there. Siemens are currently um, operating out of Nig Energy Park at the moment in the build out of the Beatrice Offshore Wind project, um, which is you know, you know, currently being built very um, and near completion in terms of the build there. Um, other sites close to that include the Port of Cromarty Firth, which is currently in the phase four expansion, and that is um, predicated upon securing the contract from the from Murray East for, for build out of the Murray East project. So really, I just want to highlight that, that there are indeed um, areas where investment is being made, and um, the benefits of that investment is starting to be realised in terms of contracts secured. I do appreciate that's build-out phase, not necessarily the high-value manufacturing on a long-term sustainable basis, but it is a start, and it's about building the, the cluster of activity and the momentum there, um, and really just looking ahead in terms of an industrial strategy, um, picking up from the offshore wind sector deal. 
indeed the sort of clustered approach is what we are working with industry, with local authorities and with government on, and in, um, looking at, for example, a north, uh, north cluster that includes those locations that I, that I mentioned, but actually very much the broader supply chain. <coughs> and really just worth <coughs> excuse me, highlighting that um, up in Wick, we have the O&M facility for the Beatrice project. Um, that 20 million investment, SSE-led investment, um, is really doing wonders for that local town. And in terms of jobs there that will be created, estimated 100 over the lifetime of that project. So I guess I was just really wanting to highlight that whilst, yes, we absolutely do appreciate there are real challenges um, in terms of getting the high value and jobs that, that we have um, really aspiring towards, I think we really want to recognise that there are some successes as well. You have not commented on competitiveness. Apologies. In terms of competitiveness, um, my example I was going to highlight was indeed CS Wind, but Nick co covered that very well in terms of the productivity improvement that CS Wind have um, uh, undergone. And indeed, even with that, they still, as a company, have challenges in terms of competing in what is a commodity market for towers and indeed you know, a global, global market. But working with CS Wind and indeed others, um, we are very, you know, very much um, looking at tools at our, our disposal as enterprise agencies, such as a manufacturing advisory service, um, to, to work with the companies to see how they can um, drive efficiencies in their processes, and through, whether that's through increased automation or whether that's increasing the output. Um, and in terms of other areas of productivity, um, not just on the infrastructure side, but absolutely on the company's side, through the account management approach that we have within Highlands and Highlands Enterprise, it's mirrored in, in Scottish Enterprise, we do work intensively with these companies to try and understand what, what improvements can be made. Um, and again, just highlighting on that it are indeed other companies um, that are already picking up orders from the offshore wind market, particularly in the marine services side, and project management side as well. So again, working with those companies is about how can we grow that share of the business. Um, Angela Constance and then Dean Lockhart wanted to come in. Convener, uh, Mr. Sharp, uh, you said that the issues are fixable. So I wondered if you could give us your top picks of issues to be fixed, uh, how, how they will be fixed and by whom, whether that's industry, the Scottish Government or the UK Government. Thank you for the question. I think you're right to um, mention three bodies there and there's, there's probably more as well. Supply chain themselves have a role to play, unions too. Um, so the historic kind of lack of investment at, at Bifab specifically is is an issue uh, which which can be fixed, and, and it's it's not necessarily an issue which requires just the spending of money. It's a mindset change as well, and that's really come through from our discussions with industry companies which have um, managed to compete in offshore wind where they weren't previously have really moved forward and and. Um, Smolders, a Belgian company, have a, a, um, a site in Walls End in Newcastle. That as well is held up as uh, as best practice, really. And, and Smolders have invested, but they've not just invested money; they've invested time and knowledge and management practices, and that has enabled that yard to do things that it would not have been able to do um, previously. So. It's not just the investment of money that's required here. There's the investment of time and knowledge as well. And I think our hope is that you know DF Barnes bring that kind of uh, bring that wider knowledge um, and can take Bifab beyond where it was previously. There's also an issue I think which uh, hasn't been addressed so far around financing and and bonding. Um, and these are issues that uh, contractors uh, across all industries face, but specifically in in offshore wind, which, which I can talk to briefly. Um, an offshore wind project is a very, very large infrastructure project. Um, Beatrice, for instance, is the largest um, private in infrastructure project in the UK at the moment, £2.6 billion. The companies which develop these schemes cannot do so with or off balance sheet. They don't have the, the funds to do that, and they must go out to the investment market to get those funds. Um, investors uh, are entirely focused on risk. and, and mitigating that risk and as part of that process want to work with people who've done similar projects in the past done projects of a similar scale who have the um 
who have the, the manpower, if you like, uh, to, to deal with um, sometimes hundreds of contracts at once. And, and that's why they ask the developers very, very often to, to give over that risk effectively to a tier one contractor. And, and we've seen that with Kincardin, with Cobra. Um, we've seen it with, with Beatrice too. So um, what's often neglected here is, is, is the finance element of this. And I think if, if, uh, if, if there was a role to play here, that, that uh, it would be to, to make the financiers more comfortable with the risk and, and present to them um, the, the impression, which is the correct impression, that the, the lack of sight of the pipeline of offshore wind in the UK is broadly solved now. So the sector deal is, is broadly solved. We know we're going to uh, have to more than double the offshore wind we have by 2030. So there's a pipeline now of, of predictability. Um, and the finance community needs to understand that. And if, if we can deal with the way they view risk and they view investing in Scottish projects, I think there's real... Um, there's real mileage that could be made there, and, and you know, government certainly, as as shareholders in Bifab, um, and as shareholders in Scotland PLC, have a role to play. So, it's it, a job for everyone is the answer, um, but only when um, when a lot of these elements come into come into into play together, um, will we see contracts being awarded uh, at a sizable sizable scale. Thank you. Um, thank you. I think um, Andy McDonald and also Bill Elkington wanted to come in, then we'll come to questions from Dean Lockhart. Um, thank you, Convener. I, I just, it's kind of an, an add-on to the, the answer that Audrey gave, but in terms of the, the, the rest of Scotland ports, um, and also to pick up a question you'd asked about further investment um, alongside Bill's points about the site at Fife, Scottish Enterprise is the, the, the landlord, effectively, of the Energy Technology Park in Fife. We invested last year... Uh, in hard standing infrastructure, which is part to the, the point that Bill made um, about uh, and uh, to piling works alongside the key on the key side um, as part of the support um, as as DF Barnes were coming in to the site. And we are in discussion just now about what additional works maybe need to be done on the physical site um, and then pick up next point as well with the company what might need to be done in terms of process and things inside of the areas of support. We've also, more widely, and this is partly to Mr Beatty's point, in terms of the, the broader industry, we've supported for the last few years um, in, in a specifically focused support programme for companies uh, looking to build a way into engaging with the offshore renewable sector and the wider offshore energy sector, but particularly in the follow-up to the downturn in the oil and gas sector when there was opportunity to engage companies there. So we've, we've put um, about 200 or so companies uh, into um, offshore expert support program, which is partly funded for a couple of days of free support, and then companies can can engage further and for further terms for four days support beyond that. Um, we have something in the order of 57 companies have gone through that this year, uh, as well. Specifically, it um, as at the end of that, companies who have taken it up have been successful. We've had three companies in the, in the last six months or so gone on to win something in the order of £35 million worth of contracts. Um, we also work with all the developers and have done for many years um, to try and sit within the structure of their purchasing and procurement departments to understand what opportunities may come out of that and to help them understand what the Scottish supply chain looks like. Uh, and to bring the two together, we've run a large number of events, many of them in partnership with colleagues in Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Uh, around the uh, the opportunities, we had one just towards the end of last year with Inchcape, uh, with the developers there, which had um, over 100 companies attend, uh, 60 or 70 meetings one to one with the, the developers, and with their tier one appointee companies, um, to try and understand where the opportunities were, and to try and bridge some of this challenge about what do you need to understand about how to work with each other into this space. Um, so, and then the the the, the broader company support. In terms of the physical infrastructure on the ports, um, we supported work in Dundee some time ago. More recently, the Aberdeen City deal has funded quite a bit of work in the, the new harbour in Aberdeen. Um, a lot of those investments are around the potential for future commercial opportunities, some of which will be related to offshore renewables. Uh, and in the same way as Wick and Fraserburgh have benefited from the fields, from the longer term O&M planning for the, the fields that are in proximity to them, we're working with the developers and anticipating we may be able to do similar uh, exercises for the longer term O&M for the fields that are being constructed or due to be constructed further down the coast, the east coast of Scotland and into the fourth. 
Bill Elkington. Yes. Paul, on, on your question of um, competitiveness, um, on our Concarden bid, we were second to Navantia, 10% higher, and they lose 35% a year. So to get down below, it, it, their cost structure is actually above ours. But with the um, losses that they take year after year, um, it's very difficult to compete. Um, in the regards to the Smolders comment from Nick, um, the work on this next uh, um, e uh, Murray East work is mostly being done in Europe, not in um, the Smolders yard. It's only final assembly. And in fact, on that project, we were low bidder two smolders and had a lower price until the tier one contractor um, re-tendered the work and asked for a JV. So yes, Scottish companies can be competitive. Yes, we need to uh, invest more in the yards to make them more competitive, but this, um, this area where um, others from outside are Recycling bids or losing money are, is very difficult to compete with. Can I come back to you on that particular point? Though? Yes. You, you've repeated a number of times about this question about state aid rules being potentially flouted in, in other countries. Do you have actual proof of that, other than, other than the allegation? Do you ha do you have any documentary proof, any any anything that could be used as evidence? I'm not talking necessarily in the court law, but some, something that we can. I'm, Get our hands around. I just suggest read their financials and um, explain to me how the. I don't understand state aid to, to the experts in government, but how can a company lose 35% a year, be funded by the, uh, uh, an opposing government, and that be on side of state aid? I don't understand how that could be. Um, and then the last point I'd like to finish on making is the finance and bonding element that Nick brought up is a really a serious aspect where um, uh, the developers are, are trying to shift risk from tier ones, uh, from the developer to the tier one contractor, from the tier one contractor to the tier two contractor. And that creates um, bonding and financial guarantees that are very, very on onerous for a private um, commercial enterprise to take on. It's much easier the, for companies controlled by a state or a self and work wealth fund to accept those bonding and um, financial guarantee risks uh, because they have the entire state behind them, where it's very difficult for a, a commercial enterprise to accept those types of risks. Um, Andrew Jameson, Pat Rafferty wanted to come in briefly. I think. So, Ms. Ms. Constance asked what what would be the solution in terms of what needs to be done and who should pay for it. I think there's a lot of history, as we've talked about in this meeting, and we are where we are today in terms of the construct of our industry. My suggestion on the way forward is to look at leaving the state aid issues aside. It needs to be explored, but on the assumption of there's competition out there in other countries, can we get there? So what does it mean in terms of do we have all the key component parts that are required as a nation, not necessarily for individual yards, about how we would ever compete on a level playing field, assuming it exists just for one second, uh, with other countries. So that suggests that we need to look more deeply into what is the scale of infrastructure that is required in terms of quayside and craneage and big heavy machinery, welding equipment that comes into the, the fabrication processes. Have we got the skills? And I'll assume that we do, but we need to look at have we got workforces that provide on a longevity basis the skills, remembering that we're going from one off oil and gas style production to cereal production. That's a very different nature and way of approaching things. Uh, so there are, there are quite a number of key things to take into account, and I'm not sure we have a big picture about what is it going to take in order for Scotland or indeed the UK to compete with these other countries. So um, my company, as part of the recently announced sector deal that Audrey mentioned, has proposed uh, a programme to help support the growth of supply chain indigenously in the UK. 
which currently the industry has uh, agreed to fund to the tune of £100 million over 10 years, so £10 million a year. Uh, some of that will be benefits in kind. So in terms of hard cash going into it on an annual basis, it starts at £6 million. That's not a lot when you spread it right across all of the UK. But within that £6 million, we are looking to see where we can enhance... Uh, well, we're looking at two or three different things, but importantly, we're looking at, for those in the supply chain, how do you improve your efficiency? So we'd be talk we would be talking to Bifab, but what can we do to help provide some answers on the way forward? The second thing is, for those not in the supply chain, how do you get into the supply chain? So how do you lower your barrier to entry? What are the traditional things this industry has long suffered from in terms of not understanding what the next product is going to be? How can we help new companies come into that space? Those new companies might have products and innovations that would help the manufacturers, such as Bifab, to move forwards. But we've just in, uh, so the sector deal was only recently announced, and within it, in, uh, the, in very recent weeks, we've taken to the Industry Council, who's the ultimate sponsor of the sector deal with the UK government, that we also undertake a UK uh, capacity and capability study to look at this bigger question that we're all talking about. What is it, it exists externally to the UK that we need to compete with, and what would be the steps required that would, that would get us there? So we're, under, we're going to undertake to, to look into this and work with industry colleagues to look at that more readily. My answer to Ms Constance's question is there will be a role for the industry themselves in terms of the developers in some way. Uh, so, for example, can they be clearer on the pipeline of orders that they've got and expecting in the future so as we do at least understand? Uh, and I'm taking into account what Bill is saying about it may not make so much of a difference, but it will make some difference. Is it monopiles? Is it jackets? Is it whatever for floating wind? We need to understand that more. Uh, and then there's a role for the supply chain themselves about what they're going to invest in, and then there's a role for the public sector in terms of providing other assistance to get there. So I think there are, I, I, I see within the industry itself a very strong willing to have the UK and indeed Scotland have as much indigenous content as we can possibly muster. We cannot forget it's a highly, highly competitive market. They're all elbowing each other in the face to win contracts for differences. That means that they, traditionally, historically, they've been very less inclined to share things and share learnings. And that, I think, is an opportunity with the sector deal to pull more collaboration into the sector than we've seen. That competition will still exist. That competition has served as well in terms of the prices that are on offer. So ultimately, for electricity customers, that's a great thing. But what we need now is an awful lot more collaboration across the industry and across the public sector about how we will move some of these bigger questions forward. Right. Well, sorry, we'll hear just briefly from Pat Rafferty, and then you've mentioned contract for difference, so we'll come on to questions from John Mason after that. We, we do have limited time here, so I'll try to uh, cover matters. Pat okay. Rafferty. Thanks, Convener. I'll just kind of make a general point, and it's just worth reflecting just a, a wee bit, because... You know, we think back to the 16th of November 2017 when we had thousands of people marching down the Royal Mail um, in an effort to try and save their jobs and save their communities and save the yards and Fife and Anish. Um, and to be fair and to, to give credit to, to people, um, the Scottish Government did step in and gave a lot of assistance at that time to make sure that it didn't get into administration and, you know, we still had the, the yards there, as did... Um, JD Driver and DF Barnes. And I suppose the concern that, that you have got, or I've got just now, is about that, that we make sure that we still have JD Driver and DF Barnes competing in that marketplace. And it doesn't feel like to, to companies of, of that nature that they're flogging a dead horse and that they're not going to get anywhere here and that they're competing in, in a marketplace that doesn't have a level playing field. Um, so a lot of the purpose of the day for me is to try and make sure that we understand where the feelings are and where the lessons can be learned going forward that does create a, a better level, level playing field for the likes of the bands who have gave their commitment to Scotland going forward. So, And it does feel like you know, we're pitting like, Havel and Aki's up against Barcelona um, with, with some of this. Um, so we need to you know, get ourselves into a shape that you know, we're, we're fit for purpose and can compete for these, these contracts that's there. And we don't get elbowed out the marketplace altogether and we lose companies the likes of DF Barnes that's there. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener. Um, yes, as the Convener said, contract for difference has been mentioned, but uh, I'd like to maybe try and explore that a little more. 
I mean, I have to confess I'm not a technical expert on some of these terms, but I mean, from what we've been briefed, the strike price for Murray Offshore is £57.50 per megawatt hour. A Horn Sea is similar, but Triton Knoll Offshore Wind Farm is 74.75, which is quite a lot higher. I mean, how much is that a factor in this whole equation here? I mean, for example, does it mean that prices are being driven down unrealistically and therefore Tier 1, Tier 2 are having to go for the very lowest prices they can possibly get, no matter what? Yeah, I, think Mr. I think Nick Sharp and then uh, Bill Elkington wanted to come in there. Yeah, probably worth explaining a little bit about the CFD and how it came to be and, and how we are where we are. So um, until 2014, renewables were supported by the Renewables Obligation Scheme, um, which, um, which really kind of built what we have now in Scotland in terms of especially onshore wind capacity. Um, the move to a competitive auction system mirrors uh, what is happening around the world. Um, increasingly... Uh, renewables have been driven in cost terms down and down and down and that is something that is is a global trend that's not just a UK trend um, UK government uh, has chosen to uh, effectively lock onshore wind and large-scale solar are two cheapest forms of renewable energy out of the market since 2015 um, and what they have said in their manifesto is that they want the consumer in the UK to have the lowest energy prices in Europe um, when I started at Scottish Renewables five years ago, we were wondering whether offshore wind could ever get to a level of £100 a megawatt hour. And I think there you say that, uh, rightly, that Murray East is down to £57.50, which is, is truly incredible. And the price journey that offshore wind has gone on, kind of uh, supported by innovation um, to a large extent. So we've seen now much, much larger turbines, which are much more efficient, can get much more power from the same resource. All that has led to costs for offshore wind now um, been very, very low. Um, whether We're also doing a study here on the construction industry, and it seems to me there's some parallels here, because there's an argument in the construction industry that because we concentrate so much on price, it, it, it reduces the leeway that people have for innovation and maybe for supporting local companies and that kind of thing. Is, is, there a, is that an aspect that's in here as well? So I think UK government's decision to concentrate on, on price for consumer is something that as an industry we just have to work with. Um, we, we, our, our members have to submit competitive bids to get that contract for difference. If they don't get the contract for difference, the project will not be built and there won't be any supply chain benefits at all. There'll be no project. Um, in terms of innovation, uh, two things really. Andrew can speak much more, uh, much more, in much more detail about innovation. It's the role of the offshore renewable energy catapult to push innovation into um, offshore energy. Um, so I'll leave that to Andrew. Um, but also the sector deal, I think, is 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 a really big thing for industry. And, and I know uh, colleagues across the UK have worked with the UK government for a couple of years on this. And, and certainly Scottish Renewables, um, we we stepped up because uh, we wanted Scotland to have the best representation possible in that sector deal. And parts of that are about driving innovation. Um, and that is an accord that's signed with UK government, between UK government and industry. So um, it's, it's obviously it's more challenging if costs are lower to, to do innovation, to find the, the space and the bandwidth to do innovation, but it's still happening. And it has to keep happening because the ambition is that, that costs continue to fall. Okay. I think Bill Elkington wants to come in. So, um, I agree. The, the uh, uh, worldwide the cost of wind and offshore wind, in particular, is is, is dropping close to by 50 percent. Um, but these projects are three billion dollars. For example, Beatrice um, was in in 2.84 billion. Um, Scottish sec or the UK government sector deal is looking for 60 percent local content. At Beatrice, the data that I've seen says there was four percent. Um, Scottish content, 4%. How are you going to get to 60% when we're today at 4%? And uh, if the, um, if the, uh, uh, the difference between a fabricator like Gus and, and, and a, a fabricator like Navantia is 10%, that's 0.4% of the 
of the uh, total development. I don't think that will swing the price of, uh, uh, of the offshore cost significantly. And so that's where I, I'm really uh, confused is the foundations and, and the piles that can be built in the UK and Scotland um, going offshore for such a small amount. The cost of the turbine is the main cost and that's where other governments have put substantial research in. All of that is being done primarily in Europe um, and, and Asia. And so it's going to be very difficult to get to 60% um, without really concentrating on the foundations, um, the, the, the piles, etc. I would like to come back to local content in a minute, but I just wonder if anyone else has anything to say about specifically about the contract for difference. No? Okay, uh, we're going to develop the question about uh, local content because there's something we understand called the Murray East Supply Chain Plan, and uh, that seems to have certain uh, targets, and presumably the idea was to create a more local... Um, content but I mean I think we've had some difficulty finding out some of the detail of that because some of that has actually been redacted and for example within that it seems to say that the wind turbine supply contract it is, is expected to deliver and then the percentage is taken out local content the jacket substructures contract has the potential to deliver up to redacted again local content the onshore electrical works and OSP's contract is expected to deliver again redacted local content um, so, and the question was raised which I suppose I'm reiterating how can we get up to that 60% and especially if we don't know the detail I don't know if this is something that anyone actually knows about here Mr Welsh does problem then um, if you look at the Murray East project you're talking about a 2.6 billion pound project 950 megawatts Consent given in 2014 for 100 turbines is going to power 40% of Scottish households on 950,000 homes. The consortium um, that's financing it, EDPR, Portugal, Diamond Green, Japan, part of Mitsubishi Corp, China Three Gorges and Onji in France, EPCI Tier 1 contractors, Demi Gosi. Lamprell will manufacture 45 jackets, a value of 160 million. Smulders will manufacture 55, 55 jackets, um, their own value of that through the press release was 250 million euro. They'll manufacture those jackets in yards in France, Poland, Belgium, and the northeast of England. Put that in the context of the Beatrice contract, which manufactured 28 jackets, supported 1,400 jobs. So we can make a best guesstimate there about the number of jobs that are going to be supported by the fabrication of those jackets at Lamprey and Smulders. We spoke about the green shoots in Bifab earlier on, uh, about the manufacture of the jacket piles and arnish. It's a contract worth, if, if I might, you guys can correct me, about 26.5 million. It's supporting 82 jobs. That's 1% of the project value. So that's the extent of the problem that we're looking at just now when we're going into, we're talking about local content. So if you're going to 60% local content to there, look at what's happening in the Moore East project. And let's ask the questions why that is happening. Right, well, that's what I'm going to ask. I want to ask you, yes. Uh, <laughs> why, why is that, what is that happening? I mean, are we not setting ambitious enough targets? Are the targets not getting broken down? Or once we do set targets, are they too vague? I mean, I think the suggestion was earlier that we're not enforcing anything in this country. Is that the problem? Um, well, we can tell you what I know about the competitors. Um, and I think you've all got the brief on Lamprell. Um, should be before you just now. Um, they're in a joint venture um, with the... Saudi, uh, Saudi Aram, uh, Aramco uh, within there and the joint ventures that they're involved in with the Saudi government you can see the breakdown of the investments that are going in there it gives you a glimpse of the competitive environment which we're trying to get a toehold in just now I think that's the scale. Of, I think that's the scale of the challenge. But if there's a, is there a specific question in there that, well, uh, that you want to get are, to, it, it might not be me that can answer it, yes. but we'll try. Okay. <laughs> are, are, are other countries managing to get more local content actually in the plan? Well, and other countries are getting other content. Happening. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I get that. Yes, but uh, yes, okay, right. <laughs> yes, that's part of the question. I suppose I'm looking at it the other way around. Yeah. Um, you know, why is it other countries? I mean, maybe subsidy is an issue, so let's leave that aside just now. But are they? With the suggestion I think was made earlier that you know other countries they put a, more of a specific 
point in the contract and then they enforce that contract, whereas we've left it too vague? Is that is that part of the problem? Perhaps there's maybe some maybe more women people around the table right. that may be able to kind of answer that. Mr Jimison. I think this is an important point, but we do need to recognise other countries for decades have run their industrial strategies very differently from this country. So I, I think we're making valid points, but you're talking about an entire nation, an entire approach from governments, whether it's regional or national, doing things very, very differently. And I don't think culturally that that's what suits uh, current thinking within the UK or in Scotland. We just don't do it. Other countries have, as I say, they've been doing it for decades. And whether it leads to state aid or anything else, I can't comment on. But um, it, it's just a very different way of how they run their manufacturing sectors, which, you know, we've all seen uh, change very, very rapidly since the 1970s. So are you that's, that that's, that's what we're up against. Right. Are you saying that other countries, the government sees itself as partly responsible for the manufacturing sector, <coughs> but in the UK, it's been a very hands-off, just let them get on with it themselves? Well, I I'm not blaming the current UK government, but, you know, my experience from going into industry in the 1980s is uh, everything's been down to markets. That's what everything's been about. Compared to the European continent, they've They've been uh, more content at making strategic investments in whichever sector they wish to support. And yet, and yet in, in another... All I'm saying is that that's the scale of what we're up against. It's not something just for this element of one part of the electricity industry we could suddenly fix. It's a very different construct. And Sean Farr, I think you <clears throat> But yet in another sector, Scotland, Scotland has, has led the way. In Canada, we have admired for years, in eastern Canada, we have a small oil and gas industry offshore oil and gas industry, and we've admired for years how Scotland has developed it over here and become world leaders and to the point where they're exporting their technology and their creativity around the world now. And uh, so I don't think Scotland needs to look any further than the success they had in, in offshore oil and gas to look at examples of how it worked well. Indeed. And, and in further that, the... Uh, uh, the regulatory regime in Newfoundland copied the Scottish uh, regulatory regime. Um, but we did, in, in, in that instance, add local benefits agreements where um, the developers would have to live up to their, their uh, local benefits agreements. Um, the, one other point I, I did want to make is, is uh, um, on, on the uh, first round, we were low bidder um, on the uh, Murray East project. And that bid then got recycled until, um, and, until we were no longer the uh, low, lowest bidder. And so in other jurisdictions, what we've seen to deal with that is a bid depository, where the bids get submitted to, through a, a, an agency uh, and, and, sh and then shared confidentially with the developer. But uh, we know where we sit, and it does not get recycled. Um, we should be employing the people that work for us in Arnish are very, very good. The people that uh, work in Fife uh, have the capability, and our role with our, our, our uh, union co counterparts is to make them as competitive as possible. And we've been, we've been expending um, uh, time and energy uh, sharing what we've done in, in North America, and we've now got a facility in North America where we're doing work on, on uh, a Gen 6 rig that has never been done in Canada before. And um, we can work with our unions to, to make these viable, but uh, we, we have to have a better uh, regime so there's more fairness in, in, in the, uh, uh, to get the local benefits. Can, can I just follow up one point? And then you, you said that in Canada, um, you know, there is this insistence on local content and then there can be penalties if that doesn't happen. Where should that be introduced in this kind of chain? Is it, is it at the, the CFD level? that uh, that's where it should be. Yes, so the contract for difference, the consent letter needs to be binding, or, or that contract, that commercial agreement, uh, needs to be binding such that those commitments um, are lived to, and if they're not, there's financial penalties for the developer. Okay, thanks. So I just wanted to add, UK managers have made it very clear to the Industry Council as part of the sector deal that if they don't see local content or indigenous content, because it's not always local, yeah. but it's across the UK, mm -hmm. uh, match what the industry has said it's an ambition, then there will be consequences to how it supports the industry. So the CFD routing has actually been a strong 
mechanism for showing there are going to be future rounds of contracts. So for all of us, we should be uh, taking heart that there is going to be a pipeline of more projects coming through. But UK ministers have made it very clear to the industry, if they don't see the growth in local content, that will get switched off. Right. Um, Follow-up from Andy Whiteman and then we'll come to Jackie. Yeah, just, just to be clear on this point, I mean, there are, as I see it, three main routes by which government can seek to implement the kind of local content uh, agreements you're talking about. One is the landlord lease, that would be the Crown Estate, who are leasing the land, the seabed. Two is the planning consent um, that was referred to earlier by Marine Scotland um, and the electricity consents regime. And the third would be the contract for difference contract. Are you clear that it's the contract for difference bit of the agreement that would be the best place to do that as opposed to the other two? Uh, I'm not um, clear on that uh, okay. myself, but uh, I'm sure there's people um, within the UK government and Scottish government that can figure out which one has the most teeth and yeah. how it does not uh, create any state aid rules. But yeah. we, we see it with other countries that have trade agreements with uh, multiple countries and, and they all fit within um, those types of arrangements. And possibly join these up. Yes. Yep. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, Audrey McKeever and then Jackie Bailey. Yeah, so just in response to that, Mr. Whiteman, I'm um, conscious that the Crown Estate Scotland, who are, um, have been consulting on their next leasing round, Scotland, um, have indeed been taking um, a view on socio-economic impact as a factor in lease awards. So I just wanted to, to highlight that. Yes. They, they may be taking that as a factor, similarly to what Andrew Jimison was saying, the UK government is saying it might change its policy. The point is, is it putting, is it proposing to put anything binding in contracts? I don't know. It's one, it's one thing to wait uh, an agreement or a competitive agreement as to who, whether someone should be awarded a contract. It's quite a separate matter to make sure that once that mm -hmm. is awarded, the criteria that went into uh, um, that, that securing that uh, uh, award is, is, is adhered to. In terms of whether it be at um, lease award and um, consent or at CFD... The Crown Estate. I mean, if yeah, it is so taking into account socioeconomic benefit yeah. and a company is saying we're going to create X socioeconomic benefit yeah. and therefore they get a lease, yeah. there has to be a means of making sure that the basis upon which that lease was awarded, the promises and commitments that were made by, in this instance, the Crown Estate, can be implemented and there are actually sanctions if they're breached. That's the point I'm making. Yeah. That's fair, surely. Fair. Um, absolutely. I, I guess it's just in terms of how binding those statements are. Yep. Um, but what I was going to say in terms of the journey of a project through lease award to then consent to then securing a CFD, it's probably at the CFD point where there is a slightly greater degree of certainty that a project will indeed proceed with the current project partners because for the projects that we are aware of at the times of awarding lease to now progressing with their projects, the makeup of those projects, uh, of those developers have changed quite considerably. Um, so it's perhaps at, towards the tail end, if you like, of that process that the more enforcement would be applicable to come in because there's more certainty around the nature of the contracting. That would be my view. I think we'll come to question from Jackie Bailey now. Okay, it follows on, convener, because I want to stick with contracts for difference, um, but also, the, the, in particular, the submission of supply chain plans. Um, it looks to, to me, from the reading from our briefing, that these are submitted very much at pre-registration stage, and I'm wondering what work is done with them, what scrutiny is done with them um, at pre-signing allocation um, and also at the start date of project delivery? Are there any conditions applied? Or is it just at that very early stage that there is a supply chain plan put in place? Who would like to answer Anybody that? know? <laughs> Andrew, you were clear uh, earlier on this about is, the... This is absolutely not my forte at okay. all. I'm afraid I can't advise okay. with any authority. So, 
So given what John Mason said about the lack of detail in, in the one example we have, and most of it's redacted, it could be a very high level, very general document that's right at the beginning of the process and no further attention is paid to it. Hmm. Scottish Enterprise or Highlands and Islands, do you know? I think um, I could add that in terms of Highlands Islands Enterprise experience, particularly with respect to Murray East, um, going back to 2009, um, we engaged with the developer and um, very much with a view to try and shape that supply chain plan. More with a view, and, and similarly, SE and colleagues in SE were working with the other developers um, in Scottish waters. The view was to really try and ensure that though they are very much aware of the Scottish capability and to try and encourage a sort of broader look at a supply chain as opposed to using just established um, um, or preferred suppliers. Um, that's to help shape the plan. What we haven't been able to do is to enforce that um, in, in terms of how that's rolled out. Um, but clearly, that's where it's market forces that have come into being. It's around um, then what commercial decisions have, have had so to be made. You, 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 I don't want to mischaracterise this, but you've helped shape how that would look. But then the companies have gone on and done something completely different. They've had to follow then normal contracting okay. procedures. OK. And, and I want to come on to bring Andrew back in in a second, <coughs> um, because you specifically said that the government takes a very dim view of this. I mean, I forget your exact phraseology, but they would crack down on it. Um, have they done so at all yet in so, any project? Uh, again, not my forte, so I'm not aware of uh, what might, have, might not have happened uh, privately with individual companies in the government. I think there's a few things here. So I'm not an authority, as I was saying, on um, what the position of the local content plans that need to go into, uh, into the bidding process in order for a company to win a contract for difference. Um, but I think there's a few other things to take into account, which is not that long ago, five, seven years ago or so on, offshore wind prices were out of the market altogether. So there was a huge question mark about, is this a sector worth supporting whatsoever? So the industry has been working extremely hard to prove that it can get costs down to competitive levels with other technology types as we seek to green our economy and green the, the generation supply in the UK. So that's a success for the UK. We should not ignore that. Nevertheless, I think what we're now seeing, and we mentioned the sector deal, and it's worth keeping mentioned in the sector deal, because that's now the new you know, line in the sand about saying, right, now we seem to have gotten in a competitive position. There's still a few things to deliver, so we need to be delivering at these very low prices. That is a challenge for the supply chain, ultimately. How can we get to those low prices? But what we've got, from what I can see, and I'm just giving you the circumstantial evidence rather than a, you know, here's a specific project, but there's a far stronger willingness across the development community to recognise the role in taking the industry forward is much more than what they had to do in these highly competitive stages, which is design a project, usually in a darkened room, and then emerge and say, right, hands up, who wants to build this project with me? And it just goes out to tender, and the cheapest one wins. And if you didn't, and whilst, you know, and their, their first port of call would be UK supply chain, if they didn't have the capacity or the capability, they would just go, well, I tried. And that was kind of the end of the engagement, really. And I think that's what's beginning to change, is that people are recognising for longevity of the sector, for longevity of hitting low prices again and again and again, we've got to look at things differently. So I know it's not saying we're ready right now, and I know it's not saying we fixed all that in the past, but it is a way of saying, as we look into the future and ways forward, we need to be doing things differently and more robustly to support supply chain in the UK. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm clear about that, but the question is how we get there, and we're clearly not there now, despite the UK having a wind industrial strategy yeah. from 2013. So I'm curious to, to know from the trade unions as well, when you're calling for an industrial strategy, are you talking about a revamp of the UK one? Because much of what the UK says, um, BIFAB is a leader in jacket foundation supply, roles for the Scottish Government, SE, high um, supply chain plans, all of that reads very well. So are we talking about a Scottish industrial strategy that would feed into that? So clarity on that point would also be... It's helpful. both, but I was going to say, in terms of lessons learned, uh, look how quickly uh, support for onshore wind eroded with the UK government, because they weren't seeing the jobs that they could take on a political level to say, this is worth the justification as to why I want to grow this industry. So the offshore wind is heeding that very loudly, uh, and doing its best to put actions into place, but it's going to take some time for the full effect, I think, to come through. 
Um, Sean Flower. Thank you. There's been a lot of lot spoken about competitiveness, and just let me make it clear that we don't. If, if there's any impression that that we moved in here and bought Bifab, Bifab and expect whether we're competitive or not to win contracts, then let's dis, dis, dispel that. We have a responsibility to be competitive. That's what we do around the world. <clears throat> uh, we win contracts because we're competitive and we are successful. What we're suggesting here is that the, level, the playing field is not level. If the playing field is level, it's up to us then to be competitive. And <clears throat> as Nick pointed out, there, or, you know, there are a number of things happening at Bifab. But we, we understand um, serial manufacturing. We do it in other places in the world. We have experts at Bifab right now um, in project management and, and lean manufacturing and so on who are, who are leading that, that training. We understand that we need to be competitive, we just need a level playing field. That's, that's our point. And, and further to that. Um, on the uh, local benefits side, um, we work in various countries all over the world. One of our companies is a technology com uh, company, and it provides technology to large infrastructure projects, um, most specifically in oil and gas. We work uh, in Nigeria, we have to have a local partner because there's local benefits agreements in place. In the Middle East, uh, where we are competing against Lamprell, we need to have a local partner to work on projects in the UAE uh, or, or Saudi Arabia um, to be able to deliver that world-beating technology to those countries. And uh, there's not, no framework around those local benefits here in the UK um, for you know a resource that is really for the benefit of the, the, the people here. Thanks. Now, I think we are, I've now, as you can see, I'm now in the chair, um, temporarily at least. Uh, so I think we have not a huge amount of time left. So if we can keep both the questions and the answers uh, fairly succinct. I think, Mr. Sharp, you were going to come in. Yeah, briefly, thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to just clarify, um, not that I can clarify, but I will clarify, the... Uh, Bill Elkington's point on the 4% Scottish content for the Beatrice project. I will ask SSE to clarify that for the committee um, because as far as I understand that is that is simply not true. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about a uh, question Jackie Bailey mentioned which is engagement with supply chain generally. Um, and what, what we've found while researching this session is there is a lot of support and a lot of good feeling for Bifab specifically and Scottish content generally in the industry in Scotland. Um, companies have gone above and beyond to put work their way and have in some cases invested, SSE invested 11 million pounds in 2010 uh, for a 15% stake. So um, cost is not the only thing at play here. Cost is not the be all and end all. And, and I take uh, DF Barnes point that, that yes, they are competitive, there are other things at play here and the, 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 let's not underestimate the damage that was done by the events of 2017 and um, the, the dint and confidence that that has created in industry and, and there's, there's a job of work to, to go through to, to rebuild that confidence I think um, and, and industry is watching very closely what's happening in Methyl and Burnt Island and Arnish because they want to invest in Bifab and in Scotland so um, just, just give us the evidence. Okay thanks uh, very much. Um, Convener, one, yeah, one sorry, you go. Yes. I was conscious that nobody really answered it. Um, is anybody sitting around the table aware of any company that has had their contract either terminated or they've been fined because they haven't fulfilled their supply chain plans? Nick Sharp represents most of them. Yeah, I, I, I have to join Andrew, I'm afraid. I'm not an expert on that part of, of the contracting. Nobody is. Something, if anyone if, wants to reflect on it or discuss it with colleagues and come back to us, you could write back to the committee. And, and that's true of anything else that's come up today that you want to uh, send anything to us, by all means, do that. Uh, right, thank God McDonald's got the next point. Uh, I've got two very quick questions, bearing in mind the time constraint that we've got. We've heard a lot this morning about the uh, potential of state subsidy in other countries and lack of local content. So um, what role do EU regulations play in contracting for these developments? And are there any changes required to make it a more level playing field? So everything's perfect. 
I could, Mr. Sharp. Yes. My, my understanding is is the the key UK regulation which has led to the development of our industry in the UK are climate change targets, and then that, that those are the regulations which have really driven the direction of travel. We want to tackle climate change. And in Scotland, we have uh, an incredible renewable energy resource. We're the windiest country in Europe. Um, and what our industry is doing is, is using that resource to bring economic benefit to Scotland. Um, beyond that, if, you, if you, again, you're talking about state aid, for instance, that, that's a matter for government. Mm -hmm. you want to try any more, Gordon? Right, my second question, we've got a better response. Um, UK government strategy appears to be let the market decide. Can the UK government regulate and dictate the proportion of work carried out in the UK? And if so, why have they not chosen to do so? Mm -hmm. right. okay. To that would be why not. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think a point that's not been made yet is when we're talking about uh, contracts for difference, or, you know, getting into the, uh, the wider uh, debate about uh, renewable subsidies, we, we, we are paying for this. You know, so it comes back to the question again, where's our share? You know, we're told that these are the jobs of the future. Not enough of these jobs are coming to Scotland. Not enough of them are coming to the UK, I probably dare say as well. Mr Jimison? So I'd politely like to remind the committee that the industry has succeeded massively in reducing costs and making it a competitive industry, uh, which from a customer perspective is a great thing. From an industry growth perspective, there's no question the industry is looking much harder at how we can grow Indigenous UK content in ways that we simply have not done before. Uh, I can only reiterate to you what I've heard directly from ministers speaking to us at the Industry Council, which is they expect to see us succeed in that front. The mechanisms, I think, we need, we're a bit, still need to be explored as to what UK government is thinking on that front. Mr Elkington. Yeah, similar to Peter's comment, um, the people of the UK and Scotland subsidise these projects. Everywhere else, or most places in the world that we work, where the resource is owned by the country, when there's a major capital expenditure to utilise and harvest that resource, there is typically some form of local benefits agreement. And so um, I would say, why not as well? Okay, Mr Rafter, you want to come in on that as well? Can I just pick up a point that, that, that Nick had, had referred to earlier about um, the damage that was done in 2017 to, to BIFAB. Um, is, is that, I mean, BIFAB now is under completely new management. Um, it's not the old management. It's, there, it's clearly um, DF Barnes and JD Driver. Is that message not getting through to, to the, the sector itself that this is, there is a change, uh, and a big fundamental change? I think that was a question, maybe more than a, an answer, wasn't it? It was, you right, right, kind of, yeah. Uh, well, I'm happy to take a, co a comment on that. Were you going to say something, Mr Sharp, at that point? Um, so I, I just wanted to reiterate, really, what, what, renewable, what, what renewable, renewable energy is doing, what our in, in industry is doing. So the, the average power station, fossil fuel power station in the UK today is more than 30 years old, and, and we have to replace this ageing generation infrastructure Doing that with renewable energy is the only way that makes sense in terms of meeting our climate change commitments. Um, at the moment, the turnover from our industry in Scotland in 2017 was £5.5 billion. Industry employs 17,700 people. And the benefits are not just economic, they're environmental benefits too, and we all benefit from that. So there's a lot more at play here than, than, just, um, than just economic benefits. There are environmental benefits and there are wider social benefits as well. Um, so worth okay. making that point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I think Dean Locker has the final couple of questions. Thank you, Convener. I wanted to come back to the wider question of how we can realise the future potential in the renewable sector generally um, and what lessons we can learn from, from recent history because BIFAB is just one of, example of a challenge the sector has experienced. A couple of years ago we saw the failure of Aquamarine and we saw the failure of Pelemis at significant cost to, to the taxpayer. So what lessons can we take from the, the previous problems, and I guess for the enterprise agencies, what uh, what are you doing differently? What is your strategic approach to avoid the mistakes we have seen in the past? And, and Nick Sharp, I guess I would uh, direct that question to you as well. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I think a point um, that was made by GMB earlier is quite right, that, that in terms of offshore wind, we are late to the party, but we are by no means too late. Um, and, and that's really a really important thing to bear in mind. So the sector deal, as we've heard, sets out a path to double offshore wind capacity by 2030 uh, to more than triple the number of jobs in the industry. Now, contrary to what we, we heard earlier, the, the majority of the value in an offshore wind project is actually in the operations and maintenance of that project. Um, running something like a large wind turbine out at sea is very intensive um, in terms of, of man hours and, into, and, and on equipment. So maintaining and operating wind turbines is uh, a far greater chunk of the value of a project than actually building the wind turbines. So that's something that Scotland and the UK is already doing very well at capturing those benefits. And in fact, the UK content of offshore wind um, is up above 45% at the moment. Um, where we really need to make inroads if we're to reach that 60% target that's contained in the sector deal is in manufacturing. And, and we will not reach that target unless we innovate and we grow our manufacturing base. So I think in offshore wind, the target's there. It's, it's for government and industry. Uh, they signed the deal. It's for them to deliver that. And, and we're confident that we can. If you want to talk renewables more widely, I think um, we've done very well on decarbonising our electricity uh, supply in Scotland. Uh, we've got two nukes running. Peterhead is on and off. By and large, that is it, apart from renewable energy in Scotland. So we've done very well. We're up above 70% um, share of uh, consumption in Scotland at the moment. What we haven't tackled to date is heat, which accounts for 55% of the energy we use, uh, and transport, which is probably uh, another fifth. So when we start looking at heat, that is a far more domestically focused area than we've seen here. And I think that's really been demonstrated today, the, the kind of breadth, the global reach of offshore wind is really significant. The heat challenge is something we're really just beginning to address. Scottish Government have got a target that 50% of all our energy will come from renewables by 2030. That's electricity, heat and transport. So again, the target is there. Industry is ready to deliver. Um, let us do that. Thank you. And can I ask the, the enterprise? Yeah, sorry, yes, Mr. Elkinson, what okay. as well? Thanks. Yeah, just on the, the failure of companies, um, Harland and Wolf <laughs> also failed in, in Ireland. And in the overall UK, um, you're seeing fabricator after fabricator fail. And the reasons for that is, uh, again, back to um, competing against uh, companies that can lose money on every bid. And we'll, we'll continue to see that. Um, and if we don't put people back to work in Fife soon, we will start losing that capability um, to be able to build that in the future. And then the only opportunity will be to go offshore. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to, going to ask the enterprise agencies, in terms of lessons uh, to, if we can uh, learn from, the, from past failures, what, what's the, the new um, approach that you're taking to avoid mistakes of the past? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, well, again, if I could just um, reiterate that um, in terms of energy and particularly um, renewable energy, it remains a priority for Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Um, not least just because of the um, employment potential, but also because of the reach of the benefits throughout our remote rural areas, including our islands, um, as well as large-scale generation and trying to maximise the economic benefits from that. Um, we also have a strong focus on test and demonstration. And if I could just highlight, you, you mentioned obviously the failure of, of Palamas and um, Aquamarine. We have, as a subsidiary, Wave Energy Scotland, um, really trying to, in response to that failure, trying to learn the lessons from how we supported wave technology now you, a different approach and you know a few that was established at the end of 2014 um, and now a few years on we're really making progress in terms of convergence and potentially uh, a viable technology there so again that that is a focus also, as well as large-scale generation, um, we're very aware of a move to more decentralised energy provision and matching supply and demand. So again, working hard with technology providers, integrators, and with our communities in terms of how they play into that space. But in terms of offshore wind, I think really what I want to highlight is that um, I think there's a greater understanding of the maturity of the sector. 
and we as an agency working with industry and government and intermediaries um, have learned a lot over the last decade or more in terms of what we're trying to achieve and how we perhaps have not got to where we want to be. Um, and I think if there was reference earlier to the oil and gas sector and how you know we've you know success there, um, but looking at the maturity of that sector and actually it is arguably relatively recently that that sector has recognised the importance of its supply chain, that the the operators, which is akin to the developers in offshore wind, recognise the importance of their supply chain in terms of risk mitigation. And I think that's really what we want to cut, encourage and work with developers and tier ones around developing that UK supply chain to um, mitigate risks as they develop the, the offshore wind sector. Our developer engagement is already really strong and we will continue to work hard with developers. I guess we're in a position now to ask a lot more intelligent questions. Um, and that's just being totally honest around, you know, how things will play out around the contracting and also to work with the tier ones and tier twos more, more constructively uh, as well. I think the step change for Highlands and Islands Enterprise going forward in offshore wind is really around the cluster development approach. And it is really recognising that we do believe that there is an appetite and a will to be more collaborative in the sector now. We're, we're witnessing that with the players that are around the table. And indeed, today in meeting, there's a coordination group around the clusters um, happening today. So I think that's where we are hoping that that cluster approach will develop better projects, better products, and improve overall productivity and, in, and grow the, the members of that group and supply chain that we'll be engaging with. Thank you. Hang on. I think Andy Macdonald yeah. wanted to come in. At that. Yeah, I'm very conscious of your time, so I'll say ditto to a very large extent because we're, we're in lockstep as far as the support and the learning that we've taken in terms of the wider industry. The other element that I think that is a very important role for us as economic development agencies, and it mirrors and echoes some of the comment that Andrew Jimison provided earlier on about the sector deal where we've also fed into that and helped inform it, and taking lessons from the oil and gas sector is the emergence of new technologies and the importance of taking some of those technologies, supporting the industry base around collaborative research, so we support the Energy Technology Partnership, all organisations like the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, the Power Networks Demonstration Centre, all these bodies, the National Manufacturing Institute for Scotland, which will be established, which are about engaging companies in getting research and collaboration that can be commercialised, and then our function is also to help get that into commercial play. And a large part of what was indicated by Martin Whitmarsh's report, which helped inform uh, some of the work in the in the sector deal was that in this space for the UK and for Scotland, uh, one of our big opportunities is in new and innovative technologies. And we have a lot of offshore expertise from the oil and gas sector, and we're working very hard to try and transfer as much as possible of that appropriately into the, uh, the offshore renewable sector as well. I think Jamie Halker Johnson, did you have a brief follow-up? A uh, very brief, uh, very brief follow-up, and more, more, more of a statement. Really, we've already talked about um, the issue of um, state aid and uh, and and the kind of confusion over that. So, uh, there's that very much a feeling uh, in some areas in the Highlands and Islands that we missed out on the opportunities of onshore wind. We now have this huge potential for offshore wind coming up. Are we ever going to be able to have a competitive supply chain if we don't get this issue of state aid? or potential state aid resolved. So is there, is there a role now for the industry or for government to finally, uh, or for somehow to get uh, some sort of agreement or approach on identifying whether there is a level playing field and what can be done to compete against that? Well, perhaps Peter Welsh wants to make a statement in response to that statement. I think um, it will kind of add on to that. Um, what we said ahead of today was that this should be a starting point for what we do moving forward. I think that there has to be something tangible comes out of the summit. Um, next month um, and to focus people's minds on it I think that there has to be as part of a broader industrial strategy that, that was spoken and agreed upon is that we need to understand what we need in terms of investment how we can support the infrastructure um, and also how we can look at um, rules in and around procurement and planning the situation is just now however though that the yards in Fife are empty um, they'll be maintained by a skeleton staff and our priority is to make sure that we can compete for those high value manufacturing posts um, which are going abroad just now which will be done in the Gulf uh, it will be done in the, the Persian Gulf and it will also be done in Northern Europe they won't be done in Scotland so we need to move with pace and purpose um, as a parliament as a government 
working with unions, working with industry to make sure that we're creating the conditions that are going to allow us to compete and to get jobs and value back into those yards and prosperity back into those communities. Thank you. Uh, Dean Locker. Um, I had finished my questioning. Thank you, Convener. Very good. If there are no further questions from committee members, um, then we will conclude this session with thanks to everyone who's come to give evidence today. And I'll now suspend the meeting. We'll move into private session.